Street we're moving. But this is an interview at Jefferson Ferry Living Center, South Setauket, New York. It is the 18th of November, 2003, approximately 1 10 p.m. PM. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Robert G. Spann is my name, and uh, I was born in on May 8th, 1925, and I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Oh, typical grammar school, then high school, and I was drafted right out of high school into the service. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes. Uh, I was... 16 at the time and had gone out with my parents on an afternoon drive and uh, came back and uh, turned on the radio and uh, heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. of Do you remember any reaction to that at all? I think I was rather surprised, amazed and then was starting to consider my my participation, when I would become available for fighting at that time, I was 16 years of age, I guess I kind of felt that the war might be over before I got to be draft age, which did not turn out to be true at all. Okay. So uh, you were drafted in the Army. Where were you inducted? I was inducted uh, in New Jersey and went to Fort Dix as the first way station. Mm -hmm. And your basic training? My basic training, at, uh, back in high school they had a number of programs for those that uh, wanted further education in the Army, one being the Navy B-12 program and the, then it was the Army ASTP program. And uh, at that time I qualified for the Army ASTP program. And so consequently when I was inducted, uh, we got rather special uh, special uh, attention because we had to take 13 weeks of infantry basic training before we could go to college. I mean that was the whole purpose of the ASTP program mm -hmm. was to uh, go to college, send, send the soldiers to college to get background informa uh, information so that they could become officers. So uh, we were put on a train a, a, with private, I mean semi-private sleeping co uh, compartments that had dining room service going down to Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning, Georgia, we had 13 weeks basic training in the infantry and uh, we all considered this rather interesting because we felt that we were not going into combat and that we would be going to college at the conclusion of this mm -hmm. training. This was 1943? This is 1943, October 1943, I went into the service. And uh, it turned out that at the very last week of basic training, President Roosevelt abolished the whole program. So this meant that, uh, <laughs> this meant that we, had, we were good, had good infantry training and uh, were consequently slotted for the infantry. Now from there I went to uh, Port Jackson in South Carolina, the 87th Division for training there. And at that time, two incidents happened which, which I didn't realize at the time would have an effect upon my future in the Army. And one being that uh, through chance I was assigned to a weapons company in which I would be trained in infantry weapons, the machine guns, mortars, and things of that nature. And the second was that, uh, very interestingly, uh, that a corporal that very night we came there came around and asked if anybody would like to go into the motor pool. Uh, I didn't bother even answering because I had never driven a car before. And, uh, but next morning, the company commander called out those that would report to the motor pool for training. My name was called. Fine, I went. I didn't know how to drive a car even. But we had to have a driving test, so I hopped in a Jeep, and I remember from reading how a car should be driven, first, second, third, so forth and so on, 
I uh, put it in first and let the clutch out slowly. I jumped it a little, but then off we went. And all I did was drive through the city, and we went into the countryside through dirt roads and everything. I was doing very fine. And finally, we landed up at a place where we were supposed to park, and we had two steel uh, containers as the park between. And I went in, backed up, knocked over the back one, pulled forward, knocked over the front one. I thought, oh boy, that's it. I'm out of that. I didn't pass the test. But the sergeant did pass me, so I got some excellent training in driving a, a Jeep and Army motorized vehicles and things of this nature. Okay, uh, from that point on, uh, we were eventually, this was in 1944, uh, July, I was called up to be sent overseas and consequently went to uh, up to New York and got on a uh, the Mauritania, the a ocean, a British ocean liner at that time, and uh, went and landed. Actually, we landed in England and we spent a couple of weeks there and then we got on a boat for Europe and we actually landed at D-Day Beach, so I can always say I landed at D-Bay, D-Bay, D-Day Beach at D plus uh, 60 days. <laughs> However, there was still wreckage all around. The ships were wreck, total wreckage, and, and uh, also uh, vehicles and things of this nature are still cluttering up the beach. And, and uh, we climbed over the ship on rope nets into landing craft and landed on the beach in the landing craft. But from there we took a train to the south of Paris and then got on trucks to go up to the front. Uh, the front of which we were being sent was up in Holland and uh, we uh, landed, we arrived there in September of October. I joined the 104th Infantry Division and here is the first thing that was fortunate in a way because uh, the company commander asked me what was my background. I said my training was in heavy, heavy weapons and weapons and things in, each, in this nature. So uh, he assigned me to the weapons platoon, and uh, that uh, the chances of surviving in a weapons platoon was a little bit better than being in a rifle platoon. So I felt that that was very advantageous. Uh, then. After a day or two, uh, we uh, were uh, told that we were going to have a, an attack and a, a cross the river mark and a river crossing attack uh, to try to seal off von Runstead from escaping out of Holland. And uh, we did that. And uh, I don't know, I, 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 kinda, I thought. If I have time, I'd like to read my experience about that. Uh, 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 this one? Yeah. Because I think it contains a lot of detail that uh, would be very interesting to, and so typical of soldiers going into combat. The story was written by a 19 year old combat infantry soldier to his parents after the European conflict had been won. That is me. I think it betrays the thoughts and actions of thousands of young boys going into combat for the first time, their so-called baptism under fire. In the rear of one of the small houses in a small Dutch village, a company of grimy doughboys stood in groups silently watching the sun sink below the horizon. This was the night of the assault. Our mission was to assault and cross the Mark River and push 5,000 yards to an estuary. There are five members in our squad. The 60 millimeter mortar was our weapon. Since I was the latest replacement, I became the last ammo bearer. Last night, we were all set, but we never got an order to move, and my legs and stomach were terribly nervous. But now I felt calm. The Dutch countryside was peaceful in the reddish glow of the setting sun. The artillery was strangely quiet for the first time. Here I was about to enter combat. This was to be an easy, easy mission, they said. 
I had already said goodbye to my two best pals. We had come through together as replacements all the way from the States. Now we were in the same company. Little did I know then that they were to be killed in the battle. Soon the order to move was given. Slowly and hesitatingly, we got up and fell into two columns and began to move out. In the street, the two columns split, one going to each side of the road. We kept, we kept uh, ten yards between each guy. We went down one country lane after another, passing a few well-camouflaged guns, but overall it was a peaceful, quiet walk in the country. I took to enjoying the scenery. It soon grew dark, the moon was bright. Before long, we reached our rear assembly area near the river. A few shots whistled over and the rumbling of the guns were beginning gradually increasing their tempo. I slung a pack board with 48 pounds of mortar shells on my back and trudged off behind the man in front of me. Perhaps you don't know where you're going, but if you always follow the man in front of you, you'd get there. Just across the large cultivated field was a blazing sawmill and the marked river, beyond which was the waiting enemy. We had to stop and wait a half hour, during which the artillery pounded the opposite bank in one of the heaviest artillery barrages I've ever seen. So we got the orders to move. Squad leaders could be heard softly shouting. This was it. The columns moved up to an embankment behind the sawmill, trudging faster and then faster. Hurry, hurry. Down behind the bank we ran, looking for our boat marker, numbers 8, 9, 10, 11, and here is a marker 12. Up and over the bank again, over a short grassy stretch following the white tape path to the river bank in our boat, in our boat. Into the boat, still no enemy fire. I expect any minute to have things crash on us. We reached the other bank. I stumbled out, slipped in the mud, clutching, dragging myself to the top. By the light of the burning buildings in the distance, I could see the field covered with dispersing advancing infantrymen. It was only a few minutes before the Germans started shooting rifle fire. I had heard that sound of angry hornets going overhead before in training, but here there's no safety measures. Some of us were hitting the ground. However, we had been taught not to get pinned down like this under fire, because soon German mortars and artillery would open up. Thinking it was best to head for the orchard to reorganize, I tagged on to an advancing group. Common sense told me to hit the ground once or twice when bullets started whistling all around. It was only a few seconds at a time, though. I was best, it was best to keep moving, and I wasn't wasting any time trying to get off that flat ground. I stopped for a ditch of water, but it was a hell of a place to stop, so I slid down the icy, slimy bank into the icy water, waist deep, waited, grabbed for a couple of clods of grass, and pulled myself out. The rifle fire had ceased a bit, still no fire from us. At night, we had to close in as fast as we could before firing, mopping them up. up them up with hand grenades, bayonets, and BARs, that's Browning Automatic Rifles. Damn it, another ditch of water. Holland was full of them. I slid down and sank in chest high. I could feel my feet sinking in the mud. These ditches didn't offer much protection since they ran at right angles to the enemy front. I grabbed for the top of the ditch, but everything I grabbed gave away under my weight. I tried to dig my toes in, but they slipped. I think this is the first time in combat I experienced a sense of fr fright and panic. I was stuck in the stitch. The water was freezing cold. No one around. And the Germans up opened up for the first time with artillery and mortars. The shells whined overhead, landing behind me. I was scared. A few more useless scratchings and slippings on this mud. I stopped and dead tired, dead tired, and breathless. At this point, a feeling hard to explain came over me. I could have given up the whole thing right there and died. God only knows how long I just stood there gazing into the blood red sky lit by the burning buildings. Any minute I expect a machine gun burst right down this ditch. Bullets were sporadically flying overhead, hitting around, ricocheting, kicking up mud. Perhaps I calmed down, but suddenly I felt I wanted to live more than, more than anything else. If a guy wants to live, he's got to think and act. 
I took my trench knife and began dipping, digging steps in the bank. I struggled out to the top and lay shivering and exhausted. It was simple when you think that this was not the time or place to rest. I got up in a crouching dog track, trot, headed toward that orchard again. God, it was a long way. Perhaps it was only 30 yards or so before I hit the ground again as those bullets ricocheted and buzzed around. Too close. It seemed like it came miles, that the orchard seemed miles away yet. I could hear indistinct shouting in the rear. I could see German gun flashes from the row of houses I said. I started to dig in, but it was slow. I was so tired. The bullets died down for a lull. To, this, to me, this danger seemed to pass, and I was safe. Fool I was, for it's just the lull in the firing that happened so many times in battle. And the next thing started buzzing and banging all around again. Way over to the right was another group of buildings blazing. A funny thing happened here. I prayed to God to, to give me a deep hole, for I wasn't getting anywhere digging. I stopped, stretched, and felt around, and not more than three feet from me, hidden in a growth of grass, was a dish dry and just large enough for me to squeeze in. I had missed it in the dark. I rolled in. Then curiosity got the best of me. I peeked over the top. The rifle fire flashes still came from a row of buildings. Artillery whistled in all directions over my head. Then I gave myself a mental kick. God, this is just how a guy got it in the last fight. Shot through the head, peeking out of a foxhole. Bullets flying now, some close, some high. Then through the darkness, I heard a soft cry. I heard a sharp crack and then a soft cry, not more than 20 feet away, shouting for a medic, and then again softer. The fire still went on overhead, but it was decreasing. I heard a BAR open up. A couple of our rifle squads must have reached that sinister row of houses. The mopping up began. Every once in a while, I could see a figure in the glow of the fire. None of us ever did reach that apple orchard. In fact, the Germans had an 88 cannon in there. More and more groups of men came running by, dropping ever so often and again starting off. I sat on my knees, looked up, dragged myself, covered with mud, still soaking wet, crawled over to where I heard the cry. There, in a similar spot to the one at which I had dragged myself out, lay a guy. It was too, too late, for his head lay face down a pool of blood. His new pack showed he was one of us replacements. It must have been about 1 o'clock one o'clock in the morning. I started off on a slow walk toward those houses. It was about 200 yards over plowed, flat ground. I found a bridge over the last drainage ditch, some 20 or 30 feet wide, and came with a bunch of riflemen lying, crouched, rifles waiting. Nobody knew what the situ situation was, where anybody else was, but they did know that the enemy was out there, and that was enough to know. We made our way back to the bank, to the bank, to the road where the Germans had been. The place had lit up like day by blazing barns and houses a hundred yards down. We dispersed just like back at basic and carefully walked down rifles tents. The tar paved road was covered with debris, branches knocked down by artillery, rubble and wire that had, we had to step over. We passed by vacant German anti-tank guns concealed in a haystack sighted over the field we had just come over. Walking, threading my way with several other GIs through the debris strewn street, through burning cottages, car being on the ready, I could hear the cries and moans of the dying Germans in the emplacements between these buildings. Further on, I met a Dutch woman and her children. Their fear, shock, and bedraggled appearance struck a note of pity in me. This was a scene out of a Goya painting. I soon attached myself to a heavy mortar squad from another company, and we were ordered to proceed down the road for a mile or so. This battle that went on for six more days. There were 13 new replacements that had joined our G Rifle Company. At the end of this battle, there were only three of us left. I was now a combat veteran. Uh, The battle went on for a number of days. Uh, I had joined this uh, heavy weapons company, and uh, that, that particular night we continued marching on forward and finally stopped in a place where we dug in for our emplacement. And the funniest thing happened, we, the, the battle had calmed down. And it was very interesting to be on duty there, looking over the landscape and seeing the, the, the 
burning buildings and the, the, the artillery flashes and things like that on the horizon. It struck me as a, a very beautiful scene in spite of all the, the uh, tragedy that was going on. And uh, at this moment there was no fighting for us. But a funny thing happened that uh, while being in the uh, gun emplacement hole, we heard a tap, tap, tap. And there up above us was a Dutchman repairing his roof and uh, putting on new shingles and everything. But that was quite foolish because uh, after we w went off duty, we went into a barn in order to pass the rest of the night. And during the night, an artillery shell hit the roof of the barn and blew a load of hay all over us. But uh, we were no problem there. We were safe. But in the morning, we could hear grinding away a German Tiger tank approaching us down below. And uh, we felt that, uh, well, I, our, we could call in our artillery to get that tank there, but before that, actually, that tank was destroyed, the, they fired a shell that hit right into our battalion headquarters and killed the majors and colonels that were in that uh, house that they were in. The next day, uh, we marched uh, another mile or two toward our eventual goal. And during that time, we were put into a reserve, as a reserve unit. And uh, this meant that it being in a farm yard, digging a, a hole, a foxhole there, which I spent most of the day. Now, one thing happened that I was called into the cottage in order to be briefed on something. And I remember getting out of my foxhole, going toward that cottage, and it, the doorway to the cottage was low, and as I just, as I ducked to go down, a bullet splintered right where my head had been into the transom above. And that, uh, was, I always consider my closest call to being killed. Uh, as it turned out, somewhere in back of us was a German sniper, he, unbeknownst to me at the time, had killed a sergeant who was in the foxhole next to me. The sergeant was perhaps looking out of the foxhole. He shot him. He shot a few of the others of our GIs that were around. But uh, eventually, as I understand, I found out later on, uh, we eventually killed him. And uh, while in that foxhole, I have this, I had a lot of thoughts going on there. Alone in my foxhole, I just couldn't believe that a few months before I had been in a nice uh, warm bed at home. The transition was hard to comprehend. Which was the dream? Which was the reality? Which was the illusion? Alone all day with my thoughts waiting for the next order from my commander, my thinking became bitter. Here I was in my foxhole while other SOBs, the four efforts, were back in the States living it up. We advanced no farther for the battle on the other for the battle on the other side side of the Rhine was over during the night. Still that night, while sleeping at a foxhole in a cemetery in the village which we advanced, we encountered German artillery winding in and exploding upon us. Here in a graveyard, I was reunited with my original mortar squad the next day. <clears throat> uh, the gunner. We had lost our squad leader and gunner, so I was promoted to assistant gunner. My friend Siegmuller was gone. My friend Simons had been evacuated with a chest wound. One of one, one of, the, and one of our most respective sergeants had, during the heat of the battle, just laid down crying and refused to go on. We stayed in the area few, few, for a few days. I remember one night sleeping in my foxhole when it started to rain and struggling to peg my shelter half over the wall to no avail. I remember then wandering by myself off to a nearby Dutch farmyard out of curiosity and encountered another deep and emotional experience of my life. The yard was covered with waxen figures of dead German soldiers. No blood, no guts. Only me and them. I wandered over their machine gun emplacements trying to read what sort of fellows these were. I wandered into the farmhouse to find their mess kits on the table still containing sauerkraut and bread. One fellow slumped off his bed in the act of drawing on his boot. 
the smell of German tobacco and sauerkraut was to record itself within me so that this smell, so that this, to this day the smell of somebody smoking one of those tobaccos brings me back to that farm yard. Uh, the battle was over for that particular battle. We were transported then to Aachen, uh, Germany. We replaced the 1st Infantry Division and uh, we spent perhaps a week or two uh, waiting for the command to make the final push through Germany. We were, stay we were in a cellar and uh, from there we would run out to our mortar which was in place in a garden and fire shells uh, every now and then. I remember once being uh, sent up to a chateau right on the front line and spent that evening uh, first of all bringing supplies up there and then coming up to a grand ballroom in this chateau in which all the windows had been shattered out and just remembering I was alone and giving the responsibility of operating the radio to make keep contact with the troops out there and I remember that night in which the German shells were pouring in on us on the chateau and those white curtains blowing in the window blowing back and forth in the shadowed window and seeing a grand piano in this ballroom and there I was on the radio uh, it's so inconsistent the whole thing that it was hard to believe that it was happening anyway that night passed without further incident I went back and uh, within a few days we were ordered to go on the attack uh, and uh, this was the 104th Infantry Division we proceeded to take our mortar, set it up now and then, sending mortar shells over it at the enemy. We had to lie low and uh, hear another thing interesting. I, we had at one point we were hit, had to hit the ground in a turnip patch and I couldn't help thinking that how odd it was that here uh, my uh, uh, grandfather had been a farmer and I had often been through his turnip patch and here I was lying there uh, under enemy fire. Uh, <clears throat> finally, we finally reached a point where we had to dig in. Our riflemen were attacking a cottage, a farmhouse up ahead full of Germans. And uh, what happened was that uh, I was the gunner, I was operating the mortar. One of our artillery, our, our mortar bearers who had just come into our squad. He was a 32 year old man who had a daughter back in the States. So I just got acquainted with him. Uh, he came up to me and asked uh, where where should he stay? Uh, where should he place himself? I told him about 10 yards over in that direction there. And uh, it was a terrible decision on my part for within about uh, five minutes or so the next thing you knew, I was suddenly being thrown up in the air and tossed, uh, I don't know how far, but anyway when I came to, I felt my face was all wet, wet and felt that uh, I had finally gotten it, that this was blood all over my face, but I reached up, brushed my face, and it was only mud, because I had slid in the mud from the concussion of the shell. As it turned out, uh, the fellow that I told had placed 10 yards from, our, from me. He had taken the full impact of a German mortar shell. He was killed. He took up all the shrapnel, saving most of us from being wounded. Uh, from that point on, I had a severe pain in my back. I was evacuated and went through the hospital chain eventually landing up in Paris and this was during the Battle of the Bulge. As it turned out they had developed a extreme case of cystitis That's, and they had to cure that and uh, so it was January that I was in recuperation and uh, then it was, a time, it was time to go back up rejoin our units 
and uh, so uh, we went through the repo depots that were there and I had a what happened was that in sending me back they sent me back to the wrong unit instead of the 104th infantry division unit that I was supposed to go back to I was sent back to the 1st infantry division and landed up in a company which was an ordnance company now I felt that this was fortunate to, to land up in a non-infantry company and uh, but this is no guarantee that I was going to be able to stay in this company that I wouldn't be transferred back to the 104th however the company commander was not too happy with the jeep driver that he had and here I had uh, this training and, and experience in driving a jeep plus I had combat experience and uh, he felt this was an excellent opportunity to have a driver who would act as his bodyguard as well as his driver so fortunately he was able to arrange my transfer out of the infantry now this company had the happened to be the same company that my cousin was in so the two of us continued to be in this company for the uh, rest of our uh, wartime experience and it was I think this was good this is not so good because at one point we became we came under German artillery fire crashing into our our center where we were and I just happened to think that, that both of us were killed at the same uh, time this would have been a, a tragic event for the family um, anyway my my job was to drive the commander to lead these convoys of our machine tr shop trucks and things like that uh, following up close behind the front lines we were close to the front lines and in driving the company commander we often went close to the German front lines and uh, but this was as close as I ever wanted to get again and it sort of uh, it was dangerous enough but it was I still felt that uh, I had to overcome that guilt feeling of not being in the combat uh, infantry uh, at the end of the war we were in Czechoslovakia and uh, May 8th was the time that the war ended in Germany in Europe it also happened to be my birthday the war ended on my birthday and uh, I joined the army of occupation at that time I was still driving a company com commander one of the interesting events that happened two days after the war was over the company commander said let's go down and meet the Russians so okay I, he and I got into a Jeep went down left the American line and then began passing large convoys of German soldiers <laughs> we were in between the American line and the Russian lines we were just hoping that they had heard that the war was over we continued on finally met the, the Russian soldiers uh, we come down into Carlsbad Czechoslovakia uh, the first thing we noticed the place was covered with red pure red flags we came up to the Russian soldiers and uh, they met us and we slapped each other on the back and buddy buddy and so forth and so on they motioned and we went into the village and the first thing we saw was a Russian convoy horse and wagon convoy coming by we pulled over the side to let that go by next thing you know a Russian officer came up and uh, in, in, in the field had a full chest of medals on it on and walled us out in Russian it was almost as if we were trying and we were in violation of the Alto agreement and uh, let it be known that we were to get out of there as soon as we could uh, which we did and uh, so I was in the army of occupation until I had sufficient number of points to go home came home and uh, was discharged oh well one other incident that I'd like to bring 
to the attention, to one's attention, was that during the, while the war was still on, our unit, the 104th Division, liberated a concentration camp called Nordhausen. And I was with the 1st Infantry Division, which was just uh, near the 104th. And uh, we had, the company commander and I went down to the concentration camp about the day after it was liberated. And that was a very interesting day to me for two reasons. One being to go and s to see a, this concentration camp. Prior to this time, we had no idea that any of the, anything like this was going on. Uh, uh, here were dead bodies lying in the ditches where the Germans had tried to bury them before we came. Uh, here were the, uh, the places where they had slept in the... In the and uh, this was to, is to... it remains with a deep impression on me to see what how uh, men could be inhuman to other, uni other human beings. The next event that struck me was that we went into the underground missile factory which Nordhausen supplied the workers for. Here the Germans had tunneled, put two parallel tunnels through a mountain, which was the assembly line for V1, V2 rockets. In between these two tunnels were crossed uh, tunnels of machine shops and stuff like that where they made the parts. And this amazed me, I was a young fellow, never realized that I, I couldn't help thinking back to the shooting of skyrockets on the 4th of July when I was a kid and then seeing these monstrous rockets that were up there 90 feet tall, the V-2 rockets that were raining down on England that prior to this time, and to see the manufacturing of these things, and uh, it just amazed me, and, uh, and this was the beginning of really of the space age, I think. And... Uh, Can I ask you a question about that? Now, you said that uh, Warner Von Braun had been in charge of that area because of the construction yeah. of the rockets. How did you feel when he came to the United States and basically was, quote, the father of our space program? After uh, seeing that? I, hadn't, I had no really any personal thing against Van Braun, and I was happy that we, the Americans, took uh, these missile experts, including Van Braun, and brought them back to our country to give us uh, a, a leg up on space uh, missile development. So uh, this was my feeling about Van Braun. Mm -hmm. okay. I myself was a, an engineer and uh, worked on missiles and things of this nature. So I could appreciate having him on our side. Uh, Another interesting thing happened that after I came back from the war, my mother told a story that happened during the uh, peak of combat that I was in during that period of time. Now, as you know, when a, a son or daughter, son or was killed, in combat that the parents were notified by telegram and my mother said that uh, at one point the doorbell rang and there was a telegram man with a telegram which was quite shocking to her because she thought she'd be a gold star mother. However, it turned out to be only a telegram from Sears and Roebuck telling about something innocuous. And it's through this incident that when my mother complained that Sears and Roebuck stopped sending telegrams. 
Uh, I think following the following the war, some of the things that happened that turned out to be interesting. When I first went into basic training, there was a lieutenant who was in charge of uh, map instruction. He turned out to be Kenny Gardner, who was the, the, uh, the vocalist for Guy Lombardo's band at that time. And uh, so he taught us, and okay, fine, when we each went our own ways. Coming back when I was being discharged from the Army in Europe, I was attached to a division to come back to the States. And one night I hear over the intercom, uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kenny Gardner, who is the commander of that unit, would be companies back to the States. Uh, on the ship, uh, we all sat around the piano. We were vocalists singing, he was singing, leading the singing, we were singing. Had a great time. We got back, were discharged, and went our own separate ways again. And again we met when some 45 years later, when it turned out that two doors down from my daughter-in-law's house, where my grandchildren were, here was Kenny Gardner. And he was serving cookies to my grand my grandchildren. So, uh, <clears throat> one thing I've always carried with me is my dog died. This was with me during those combat days, and I've carried it ever since. I think that brings my story to a conclusion. And only I might I have some photos that perhaps. That I just wanted to ask you: You received the Bronze Star, or did you receive that? I received the Bronze Star for meritorious service under combat conditions, and. Uh, wasn't any particular incident in particular. And, uh, All right, if you want to tell us about that photograph, where and when it was taken? This photograph was taken after I had been sent back from the front to Paris to recuperate. And this happened to be a little snapshot that was taken of me. And uh, I've had it blown up. I think it illustrates that I was pretty bitter about the whole thing. Uh, when was that taken approximately? This remember? was taken December of 1944. And this photograph? This photograph was taken after the war was over. Uh, it was taken in Rome and uh, was perhaps two or three months prior to my discharge from the Army. Okay. What do you have in the spring? Yes. <clears throat> uh, these are the medals that I received. I guess the one I'm particularly proud of is the uh, combat infantry badge. I have both the medallions, uh, the sh shoulder patches of the two divisions I was in during combat. One being the Timberwolf shoulder patch of the 104th Infantry Division. One being the 1st Infantry Division shoulder patch. Um, the medals, the Bronze Star, Good Conduct Medal, the American Service, American Theater Service Medal, the European Theater Service Medal, 
the World War II Victory Medal, the Army of Occupation Medal, and the New York State Medal for uh, veterans. My rank when I was discharged was a staff. I was a staff sergeant. Uh, I was di the interesting thing again. What was, was excuse me? What was that uh, patch in the center above the the plate with this, the wreath? This is a this is a unit patch for our company meritorious service patch. Okay. For that. Just get the plate. Okay. Perfect. And the interesting thing, I've always remarked that uh, I was, went all through this experience and, uh, and served in the Army, went through combat experience, and I was discharged before I was old enough to vote. The voting age at that time was 21 years of age. I was still 20 when I was discharged. Um, did you, do you remember uh, where you were and if you had any reaction to the death of President Roosevelt? Yes, I remember being in Germany and uh, this was April 12th. This was a few days after I'd been to the concentration camp at Nordhausen and seen the underground missile factory. And uh, this was announced to us. Uh, I remember being in a German former German barracks that we had taken over and uh, at that time uh, I was sorry to hear that President Roosevelt had died. He's really the only president I ever knew at that time because he had and he had to become president when I was only seven years of age and he was my president up until the time he died when I was uh, 20 or 19 and uh, I was sorry to hear that he passed away. Did you uh, ever go to attend any USO shows? Uh, no, there was, was a special show down in basic training in which James Milton, the uh, opera tenor was singing and we this was at a type of show which might have been the USO I'm not sure who sponsored it but anyway we soldiers were up on the stage and were able to get James Milton's autograph and talk with him and uh, but otherwise no other shows. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Yes I did however uh, when I came back, I tried to, I applied to MIT and several other university, colleges, universities, and I could not be accepted because they were receiving, the returning veterans at that time that had been in the school, the university before. I was generally accepted, but would have to be, wait a year, but I couldn't wait a year. I felt I had to make up lost time. I happened to come across the catalog about Cooper Union in uh, New York City which is a very unusual school. It's the only private school or the only one of two private schools in the whole uh, United States that gives four-year scholarships to those that qualify to enter. So I was very interested in that and uh, put my application in there happened to be 1,200 applications for 100 spots in the school. Uh, I was, had very a very good high school record, so that winnowed me down to one of a one of 800. We then went into the city to take a, an examination, three-day examination. It was five or six hours a day in which we had one subject after another in which we were quizzed. I happened to pass that quite satisfactorily and was one of a couple of hundred that went for an interview. During the interview I was accepted as one of the hundred students that were accepted. Now I got a, out of, this was a four year scholarship so I didn't have any need for the GI Bill of Rights. Although they did pay me the 
5220. Next question. <laughs> yeah, I got that for 52 weeks, the $20 a week. And also they purchased all the books, supplies, and everything else that we were required to have. I did use the GI Bill of Rights when I went for my master's degree. I went to Columbia University for that. But here again, I was now working for Sperry here on the island, and they paid for our tuition. But still, the, I was able to use the GI Bill of Rights to get my books and supplies and things of that nature. But I never made full 100% use of the GI Bill of Rights. Did you uh, ever join any veterans organizations at all? Yes, uh, I joined the 104th Infantry Division. Uh, alumni Association or Veterans uh, Alumni Association and this was interesting too because I did not have any special interest to join the American Legion or any veterans organizations at all until about 1990, 1987 I happened to have a new fella, an older elderly fella came into my uh, division, my my uh, company unit, that the project I was working on, and one day we were driving out to our site when he, we started talking and he indicated that he was in the army overseas and I asked him what division and he said the 104th division. I said, yeah, I was in the 104th division. I said, what company were you in? He said, G Company. I was in G Company. And here we were in the same company during the war. Only he was a platoon sergeant at that time, and he had been wounded when I was in, at, in the company and would have known him if he were there. But anyhow, uh, he came back into the company, and he had been a member of the Alumni Association, the 104th Infantry Division Alumni Association. And uh, he convinced me to to join and go down to the next uh, meeting that they had. So that they've been holding yearly meetings, which I've generally attended. And uh, we've had some very, we two governors were part of our division. Crary of New York State was a, I believe, a lieutenant colonel in the 104th Division. And we had another governor from Iowa who was uh, part of our associate, part of the 104th Division and the association. And um, so I have been attending these meetings. It was very interesting to, after third, say 40 years, to come back and meet some of the fellows that I had served with in Aachen. And, uh, and every, and I'm still very good Friends with one of the one of the fellows that uh, witnessed the the explode the mortar German mortar shell that hit in our squad, and he was able to give us give me and I uh, an outside view of what happened during that day. I have I'm still a member of the association. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? As you remember, I prayed to God um, many times during the battle. Consequently, I've been uh, a church member ever since and uh, have served in many capacities in the church there. Served on board of trustees, chairman of the board of trustees of these church, uh, of the particular church. And uh, I think this is one thing that changed my life. It uh, made me very religious. And in fact, I've just completed a book that I've written called The Nature of Belief. 
I just hope that I'll be able to publish it or somebody will publish it because I think it will be very interesting to those uh, it would be interesting for anybody to read also uh, I think uh, it's a very I have a very feel I have a deep feeling of thankfulness that I survived and in fact uh, being going over on an overseas tour once we went through Holland and one of the things we stopped off at was a military cemetery and uh, I can't walk through a military cemetery or even think about it so it's a deep appreciation of having survived Otherwise, I think my life is, I'm thankful that I had the GI Bill of Rights in order to follow my desire to be an electronics engineer. I served on many, served to develop many military projects, Sparrow missile, things of this nature, and uh, was actively, I would say, engaged in the Cold War against the Russians. One of the trips back overseas, I, we went to Moscow, and this was still during the time of Gorbachev, and it seemed very odd to walk among all these Russian military people on red, in Red Square, and to think that here we were enemies. Uh, I don't know what else I could say along that line. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you.